Uh, so we have with us Dr. Timothy Weidman from McGill University in Canada. He is also an esteemed member of the CRIR and he has made, been making commendable contributions to the field of pain science. Uh, he is investigating the biopsychosocial risk factors when it comes to persistent pain-related disabilities. And he has been looking for intervention strategies for the same. And I think you started doing that when you realized that there's a lack of motivational and psychological components that are integrated into our pain rehabilitation. Would you want, want to tell us a little about your journey? Yeah, um, thank you. And, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, so thank, thanks so much for the invitation. And it's really great to connect with you. Um, yeah, that, that's a really good description, actually, in terms of early on, uh, even when, when I was training as a physio, um, I found that, that there was a bit of a disconnect in terms of um, how I was being trained and then what I needed to do in, in clinical settings. And, and really, it was working, in my experience, it was working with patients with spinal cord injuries, where, you know, there was nothing that I was going to do that was going to change their impairment. Um, but, but really kind of how I approach therapy would make a big difference in terms of building engagement, helping a patient become autonomous, and, and ultimately making a successful recovery. And I just found that I really just didn't have those skills as a, as a physiotherapist. Mm -hmm. And so not not all of my research, but but a bunch of my research really kind of focuses on that how question. How can we approach um, how can we approach care so that we have more success? Uh, really framed uh, now in in the context of people who are living with pain, and then also a little bit of you know how we can kind of think about things in, in a different way that um, that hopefully again help us set us up for for better clinical engagement and hopefully better better outcomes as well. Right, right, awesome. So I have seen your multimodal assessment model of pain, and that is a really fascinating way to incorporate subjective pain into research and practice as well. So can you expand a little bit on it for our viewers here? Yeah, um, and, and great. Uh, I'm really happy that you, uh, that you engage with that. I know it's not always the easiest work to kind of access in, in some ways. Um, so it's great that you're, you're doing that, and, and I'm, I'm excited to kind of talk about it with your, your listeners. Um, have you ever heard of uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein? He's a, a 20th century uh, philosopher. Mm -hmm. Not really. So he had this really great thought experiment and it, it directly relates in my mind to the map model. Mm -hmm. um, and he had this thought experiment that was called the beetle in a box. And he uh, invited everybody to just imagine that, that everybody has this kind of special box. And, um, and everybody calls the contents of that box a beetle. Okay. And the box is special in that you can kind of open it up, take a look what's inside your own box, and, uh, and then kind of close it up. Um, but the catch is that you can never look inside of anybody else's box. And so they have this, this conundrum where everybody has this thing, and, and what they call the inside of it is a beetle but you're never able to compare what the meaning of that word is uh, to somebody else or how you know the contents of your box what your beetle is how that compares to somebody else and he jumped and he uses this as an analogy to really kind of think about pain and the inherent kind of limitations of of um being an observer of somebody else's pain uh, so we all use the word pain we all have our subjective experiences of pain but they're really our own. They're our own experiences. And we can't ever directly see somebody else's pain. We can't independently or objectively see somebody's pain. And so this really kind of raises a lot of challenges uh, for us as clinicians, because as clinicians, we have to do this every day. When somebody says pain, we have to figure out what's going on and we have to figure out what to do. And, and you know, some of the, the challenge around that is, is the question of like, you know, uh, should, we, should we buy into what our patients are saying or should we be skeptical of that in, in some way? And so really what the MAP model tries to do is it, is it tries to show us where, we're, where the edges of, of our kind of limitations are. Um, and then it tries to give us some parameters to work with that. And so really kind of focusing on, on, on some pretty basic values in terms of 
having humility in relation to experiences that you can't directly see, uh, showing, showing compassion towards those, and then using um, some assessment strategies that, that incorporate more kind of listening and, and kind of talking and, and a bit more interviewing uh, in relation to your patient. I'm, I'm pretty sure this need this will cause a behavioral change in how we as clinicians look at pain. But when we take pain as a whole, like you said, we cannot differentiate between like this person's pain versus that person's pain. How would you deal with the inherent subjectivity of pain? Yeah, so it it's really kind of wrestling with with those limitations, and I, and I think the what MAP tries to do is it, is it tries to set some kind of foundational first principles in relation to pain. Uh, so, so the notion of, of believing what your patient uh, is reporting mm -hmm. about themselves. It, it, you, know, you have a lot of discussion in terms of what you do about that, in terms of what care uh, you provide, and that, that should, you should have a lot of discussion around that. But the idea of buying in and believing and giving that patient um, the benefit of the doubt and, and kind of buying in uh, and being an ally in relation to their, their pain. That, that's a foundational piece. Um, and, and certainly we can't see pain directly, but, but all of the, our assessment tools are relevant here. So the idea of um, watching our patients, seeing what they do, um, you know, using questionnaires where appropriate, using functional tasks. Um, but then also what MAP really emphasizes is, is also the importance of listening to your patients and, and really kind of unpacking uh, what they're saying. Uh, really to try to get a, a deeper understanding of how pain has affected their lives. And, mm -hmm. and all of that together, the argument by taking that comprehensive approach to assessment um, and maybe giving a little bit more attention to that listening part and that talking part, uh, that the argument is that that will set you up better to, to kind of be a partner with your patients and, and then also kind of, you know, just a better tailor uh, treatment to them uh, as well. Yeah. So this mainly would focus on the biopsychosocial framework that we take, like taking all three components, keeping all of them in mind and building a path based on that. But I saw in one of your research itself that even though we have this framework with us, we still don't have a specific path to approach our patients with it. So what would you like to say about that? Yeah, so what, what I would say is there's a difference between multidimensional and multimodal. Uh, so the, the MAP model really focuses on looking at pain from a multimodal perspective. So multidimensional is exactly what you mentioned. It means, it, you know, in pain, it means bio, mm -hmm. biological factors, psychological factors, um, social factors, and thinking about pain as, um, you know, a function of, of those different uh, factors. Um, multimodal then relates uh, as to how, what tools we're using, what strategies we're using to evaluate pain in this context. Um, and, and so, you know, when we're looking at those psychological factors, we have a lot of self-report questionnaires, um, but we might not have a lot of research around just how to talk to a patient uh, who has uh, a lot of pain. And then, you know, I wish I could kind of lay out an evidence-based approach in a detailed way around, mm -hmm. around how to communicate uh, with, with a patient who's living with pain, but we don't have that. And, and I think that it's a function of really kind of overlooking some of these qualitative aspects, that, that mode of assessment. So, so not just the numbers of assessment, but also looking at, at those kind of qualitative aspects uh, of assessment. Okay. And, and I, you know, I, I can talk a little bit more about why, why I think that's important, if that Please interests you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so um, you know, so most physios, I'm assuming, don't live with pain. And, and so it, it can kind of feel odd to say, well, you know, why don't we just use uh, zero to 10 scales of pain intensity? Why don't we just use a standardized questionnaire? And, and to a patient, it might feel obvious as to why we would want to like focus on, on their narrative and, and focus on, on how they're describing things with their own words. But to a physio, it's not always, always obvious. And, and so an analogy that I often use is, is to kind of do, do a little kind of thought experiment in, in love. So imagine a time when you were in love and think about, you know, how that uh, influenced how you felt, how that influenced uh, the relationships in your life, how that influenced uh, the things that you did uh, during your day. And you think about all that kind of complexity of that, that experience. And then, and then the question is, you know, 
how would you rate that experience of love on a scale of zero to 10? Zero is no love. 10 is the most love you can imagine. So if you think, imagine a number that kind of captures your, your experience of love. And then imagine you're, you're sitting down with a friend and, and you kind of just, you know, share with this close friend that you've just fallen in love. And just as you're kind of ready to kind of, you know, narrate this experience and, and how it's shaped you, they say, whoa, what, what's, your, what's your intensity? What's your rating of, of this love experience of yours? And then imagine that you tell them this number and then they stand up and they leave the room. Imagine that all they have about, you know, all the information that they have about this experience is this one number. How well, how confident would you feel that they actually kind of understand what you're living and what you're experiencing? If they were to offer you advice about, you know, how to navigate this, this love experience or any questions you have, uh, how confident would you be um, in, in the advice that they have? Or, or what if they, they start to challenge your experience and they say, well, you know, that's, that's not really how I would act if I was in this much love uh, and, and they kind of challenge that experience. This of course seems totally ridiculous, but it, it's, it's functionally kind of what we often do in the, in the content, content, uh, context of pain assessment. So we, we take this really complex experience that has, has all of this impact in terms of, you know, really every, every aspect of our life potentially, particularly when somebody has been living with it for a long period of time. And we try to get at that complexity with, with this really oversimplistic uh, assessment tool, like a zero to 10 rating. And sometimes that, that's the only tool that we give to our patients to communicate it. And so they use that, they might, they say, well, I've got 12 on 10 pain. And what they're probably trying to communicate there is that I'm completely overwhelmed with my pain and I don't know what to do about it. Uh, and we kind of think about that and say, well, that doesn't make sense. Like try again um, in, in terms of rating your pain. Uh, so the MAP model tries to think about how we assess pain in relation to, you know, how can we better get at the subjectivity of it uh, so that we can better understand it and, and kind of better partner with our patients to manage it as well. Wow, that is a really different way of looking at things. Could you like break the model down for me a little bit more? Like, okay, you said that you look at more of a qualitative pain measure rather than getting into the zero to 10 factors that we usually do. What else, what other factors would you consider? So, so I don't want to say that. I don't want to say do one and not the other. Um, what the map, map model no. actually argues is to, is to consider both. Mm -hmm. and, and, and particularly it, it's emphasizing the idea that we, we have a tendency in, in research at least, and I think in clinical practice, where we kind of don't value that, that qualitative component as much and that, that kind of talking to, patient, uh, to patients as much. But, but so to get at your question, you know, how that would look differently in a clinical encounter is, is really um, starting with, with open questions. Uh, you know, can you tell me about how your pain first started and how it developed? And then when we're talking about um, the impact of pain, really trying to um, elicit um, uh, conversations and discussion and sharing around how pain, uh, how the pain has affected their life. How has it affected, um, you know, their ability to move and, and, and kind of pursue different activities, which is very much in our wheelhouse as PTs, but also kind of broaching subjects that might be a little bit harder for us, um, like, uh, you know, how pain has affected your thoughts and feelings, how pain has affected uh, your relationships, your, your thoughts about the future, uh, and things like that. And all of those are really important if, if we're you know, thinking about trying to uh, facilitate um, self-management, which is, which is like kind of best practice guidelines in the context of chronic pain. And, and they're also important if we're trying to um, you know, serve as a role of a primary care provider, where we have a role in, in seeing the, the overarching picture of the person in front of us, thinking about what we can offer them, but also thinking about where we might need to bring in extra expertise. So if we think about the overlap, for instance, between chronic pain and, and depression, we're not, we're not going to be uh, targeting depression, but best practice recommendations say that we should be screening for it. And so those kind of questions help bring us into a space where we can kind of do that uh, a little bit better, if that makes sense. Previous research that has been towards chronic pain, a lot of it has been focused using root proxy like um, you know, brain activity biomarkers or other things. So how, how, how would you say, like how important would those be as compared to self-report measures that we are 
that you were suggesting through your model? Yeah, so so I would definitely say both of those things are important. But if you're going to hold one up and say, I'm going to use this yeah. as an indicator as to whether my patient has pain or not, then, then there's no question asked that what we're going with is, is basically what, what the patient says. Uh, so there's this old adage that you know, pain is what the patient says it is and, and when, when, uh, when they say it occurs. Um, and, and basically the MAP model subscribes to that. And, and there's been a lot of amazing you know, technological developments in, in uh, between when, when that um, adage was first coined in the 60s and then kind of now, and, and a lot of that in recent years has focused on, on brain imaging. And there's been a lot of discussion around, you know, should an image of the brain or, or interconnection of, of different brain regions or a functional uh, look at the brain, should that be used as a proxy for uh, what our patients are experiencing? And, and I would say definitely not, um, uh, and definitely not when, when you have a self-report available, uh, for instance. So if a patient is able to communicate um, what they're experiencing, then we need to go with that as, um, as that, that kind of best proxy. Um, but you know, that other information um, uh, and, and other technologies are, are really important. If we're thinking about trying to understand the underlying mechanism, so, so asking the question of why is this patient reporting pain, then those tools are really important to us and we need to use them and consider them in order to kind of guide uh, guide practice, so one one analogy that I often um, uh, talk about is is the difference between uh, you know sadness versus clinical depression. So imagine a patient comes to see you, and uh, you know let's say you're a physician or a psychologist, and say, well, you know I've just been feeling really sad lately, and and I don't know why. You know you might you might do um, have them fill out a bunch of questionnaires you might um, do a bunch of investigating into that, but you probably you know, wouldn't come back and, and turn around and say, well, you know, I looked into it and it turns out that you're not actually feeling sad. You, you would probably say, you know, well, um, I looked into it and you know, good news is that you don't meet the criteria for clinical depression, but you know, now let's figure out what we can do to help you, know, you feel less sad. And in a way, what we're talking about in the MAP model is trying to think about pain in that difference. Think about it as uh, an experience rather than as um, a symptomology or, or as a, a diagnosis, if that makes sense. Um, and so sadness, sadness is really simple. It's just something, something that we feel. And, um, and we generally wouldn't question uh, a patient's report of that kind of thing. But we would feel confident you know, making a diagnosis related to clinical depression, if that was in a wheelhouse, um, and interpreting signs and symptoms to, to do so. And so often when we think about pain, we think that we should be the one <laughs> that has the authority to kind of say, you know, does it exist or, or doesn't exist sometimes. And, and what, what the MAP model argues is that really that doesn't make any sense. Um, the, the, that's, that's the patient's experience. It is what it is. And then our, our job is to help figure out what, you know, what, how to explain that, and, and what to do about that, yeah, I think that makes sense. That does. So like you said, if we look at psychological outcome measures in this way, how important would neurophysiological pain sensitivity be as a factor to your yes. avoidance or usual things? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so, okay, so you're talking about how, how important would like neurophysiological pain sensitivity be in yes. relation to the fear avoidance model or fear avoidance factors? Yeah. So, um, so I, I would, I mean, I would say very, very important. It's another, it's another important piece of that puzzle in terms of what, what again is causing this pain and what we should do about it. So if you think about one of the main intervention tools we have related to the fear avoidance model, it'd be something like graded exposure to feared movements. So this is where, you know, we have a patient uh, systematically do and engage in movements that are progressively more feared. Uh, from them. So, you know, they injured their back bending and lifting. So we get them to first, you know, think about bending and lifting. We get them to do a, a you know, simple movement, maybe in sideline around bending and lifting. So not loaded at all, then in sitting, then standing, then with weights. And we progress it based on how fearful they are uh, of that. Now imagine that same patient that has this kind of fear of bending and lifting, 
but they also have a high sensitivity in their nervous system. Okay. If we're if we're not aware of that sensitivity and we're kind of going through these, these movements and just focusing on fear, we might kind of inadvertently be flaring up their nervous system. And we might inadvertently be kind of causing more more sensitized uh, responses and and um, and and um, and and kind of not not be helping that uh, that pain sensitivity component. So it's really kind of trying to think about those two pieces together, um, and and then and then using both of those pieces to then kind of inform.